it really is a delight to be here. Uh, and I want, I want to talk a little bit tonight about, uh, about income inequality and the in increase in inequality and how, what an impact that's having on our society and the negative impact it's having. Uh, and, and I guess I should say that some of the, what I'll be talking about tonight is basically uh, the themes of, of my new book, The Trouble with Billionaires, uh, that I wrote with uh, Neil Brooks, who's a tax professor at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. Um, and I, maybe I should just maybe try and put the book in a little bit of context because, uh, you know, the truth is there's actually quite a lot of books out these days about billionaires and about the new rich. Um, but those books, I, I just want to point out that those books, you know, they tend to be uh, very flattering about the rich. They tend to be about what great contributions they make to society, uh, what glamorous lives they lead, all this sort of thing. Uh, and you know, the amazing thing is that we're, we're still seeing these kind of books come out even in the wake of the 2008 financial crash, uh, which of course the billionaires, I think, had quite a hand in, in creating. So I want to I want to talk about the extent of the transfer of income and wealth to the very top that we've seen in the last 30 years. Uh, you know, essentially, this is a development that is most pronounced in the United States, uh, but but we're seeing the same thing in Canada and and to an extent in Britain. But I guess what I'm trying to suggest by that that it's a phenomena of the Anglo-American countries. Uh, and is not a phenomena of, for instance, much of the rest, in fact, most of the rest of the developed world, of the so-called advanced world. It, it's not happening elsewhere. This trend towards extreme inequality, towards extreme concentration of income and wealth at the top. And that, that's, in a way, important to, to note because, you know, we're always hearing uh, that, you know, this is a to the extent that we have this incredible concentration of income and wealth at the top, that it's a product of you know, globalization and technological change and all those things that make it something sort of beyond our capabilities of controlling. Uh, but I think it's, if we notice that in fact it's not a trend that's happening uh, throughout continental Europe, in Japan, et cetera, and other developed parts of the world, then we realize that it's something particular that we're doing here in North America and England for that matter. And it's not a necessary result of changes in the, in the global economy. Um, the other thing I just want to note, just to put it in a little bit of context, is to put it into some kind of his, historical context. Because the truth is that the level of income concentration at the top that we have today, we haven't actually seen that much income, concentra income concentration in Canada, or the United States for that matter, for almost 100 years. Uh, so we're, we're talking about a situation that takes us back essentially to the 1920s, uh, which was also, in fact, an era of extreme inequality, an era of extreme inequality not unlike the era of extreme inequality we're experiencing today, uh, where back then, as well as today, there was a very small and powerful elite that, that dominated at the top. But of course, we know that in 1929, there was that brutal Wall Street crash. And as a result of that, things were dramatically changed. Uh, that crash was devastating, and there was tremendous public anger as a result of it. And, oh, thank you very much, Dennis. Oh, this is, I guess, this is my gin and tonic, is it? <laughs> uh, and, and, and as a result of that crash, and that, there was that public anger, and that public anger was very much turned on those at the top, on the, on the financial elite that was held responsible for bringing about the financial disasters. And as a result of that, there was a kind of hostility to those at the top, to those that had made out so well. Uh, and, and so because of that, labor 
uh, and progressives were kind of able to take advantage of that public moment of anger and push for reforms that were to bring about far-reaching changes. Uh, and among other things, those reforms uh, that we saw reflected in things like the New Deal in the United States and its repercussions here in Canada, among other things, there was a sense of the tremendous importance of unions and the establishment of important union rights. Uh, and, as, and as a result of that, um, and also a push to regulate financial markets in a way that they had become quite unregulated in the late 20s, as a result of that, what you basically saw was a very different society emerge after the Second World War. So from the changes in the 30s and then coming through the, the war, what emerged in the early post-war period was a very different kind of society. Um, a society that essentially saw the rise for the first time of a significant middle class. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I want to, I don't want to over-exaggerate because it was a society that was very much a capitalist society. Uh, but it was, it was very different than the society that had come before it. It was dramatically different. And that one of the differences was that the, you know, partly through this strong unionization and the role of unions in pushing up wages, not just for themselves, but having a ripple effect throughout society, and that that contributed to the, to the rise, as I say, to, of a kind of middle class, the economic gains were much more widely shared. There was economic growth, but instead of it all going to a small group of people, it was much more widely shared throughout society. Um, in fact, interestingly, it's often referred to that period from the end of the Second World War till about 1980, is often referred to as the golden age of capitalism. It was capitalism, but it was a golden age in that the extremes of capitalism uh, were softened by this wide distribution of income. And in fact, just to give you a, a sense of how, how, in a sense, good things were from an economic point of view back then, uh, average incomes back then were roughly doubling every 20 years, you know, compared to what we can, what we experience in today. In fact, the, the, the thought at the time, the questions at the time, were with economic growth, growing as quickly as it's growing and being shared as widely as it's shared, what are we all going to do with our leisure time in the future? That was one of the big questions. Uh, and by the way, in case I'm making this sound like this is some imaginary world, uh, let me just ask, uh, anybody here born before 1980? <laughs> One, one or two? <laughs> uh, well, of course, then my point is, you know, anybody born before 90, 1980 kind of lived in that world a bit. Uh, and, and my point in pointing that out is that we're not talking about some, something that's difficult or impossible to imagine. We're talking about something that most of us actually live through and experience. Um, and, and, and of course, the, the notion of the public good was absolutely essential to that. Uh, society was seen to some extent as a, a community, a community where everybody was a participant, everybody had to contribute through the tax system, and everybody benefited through the benefits that the tax system was able to provide. Uh, and this was called progressive taxation, and the contributions of those at the upper end were proportionally bigger than those down at the lower end. Uh, and, and, and so the truth is the rich actually paid a lot more tax in that period than they had in the period before 1929 or for that matter in the period that they do today. Uh, but the important thing to note was despite the rich paying higher taxes uh, that we're always told that would, is devastating for the economy, in fact, the economy grew like wildfire. In fact, the whole notion that high taxes discourage economic growth 
was absolutely disproved by the experience of that early post-war period. Uh, there was incredibly strong economic growth, much stronger economic growth in those decades then than there had been before 1929 or that there has been since 1980 when this period kind of ended. Uh, but, but as I say, the important thing to note is that there was that incredibly strong economic growth, but it was widely shared. Now all that started changing in 1980. Uh, we see a kind of counter-revolution begin. We see the pushback from the from the elite, we see the rollback of the egalitarian gains that were made in that period. And that whole notion of the common good, the notion that we're sort of in society together and that government has a very strong role to play, uh, that notion that was of course reinforced in the, in the war when government was seen to be, be paying a very, playing a very strong role and a role that could benefit everyone that all those notions start disappearing. Uh, in fact, not disappearing, but being deliberately pushed aside by this sort of new neoliberal, neoliberal attitude. And instead, that notion of the common good is replaced with the notion of you know, survival of the fittest, greed is good, all this sort of thing. And of course, what we see as part of this campaign to roll back the egalitarian gains you know, we see very specific programs, the dismantling of uh, the progressive tax system. We see the dismantling of labor protection so that labor is very much under attack and, and no longer has the strength that it had in that earlier period. We see privatization and deregulation. All, you, we all know the agenda. And at the time, of course, we were told uh, that this was uh, you know, trickle-down economics, right? That by allowing, uh, you know, this accumulation of income and wealth at the top, you know, we would actually all benefit because the benefits, we were told, would trickle down and we'd all get them. Well, okay, now we have the benefit, 30 years later, of looking back and assessing what's going on and we can actually now say definitively, in a way that we couldn't say at the time when we were being told that this would benefit us all through the trickle-down theory, we can now identify who has benefited and who hasn't. And in fact, it's really quite striking because the truth is that in the past 30 years since 1980, uh, you know, the income growth, we've continued to have income growth, but all that income growth Instead of being shared widely, all that income growth has gone to the top. Uh, and it's gone to the top 10%, but most specifically, it's gone to the top 1%, as of course the Occupy Wall Street movement has so beautifully identified that top 1%. Uh, and more particularly, it's gone to the top 0.1%, the top 0.01%. The higher you get up that ladder, the absolutely bigger the gains have been. But meanwhile, the incomes of average people, the incomes of average workers, uh, haven't grown at all. Once you factor out inflation, uh, you find that in fact the numbers show that there's been virtually no income growth for ordinary people in the past 30 years. Uh, you know, now maybe that seems that you may be thinking, well, geez, no, is that really true? It wasn't there, haven't I done a little bit better? Here, here's the important thing to, to look at, that when we look back on that period before 1980 versus the period after, don't forget to the extent to which the middle class has been able to keep up to where it was before, it's really been by working about twice as hard. You know, before 1980, the single parent family was kind of the norm. Uh, now, increasingly, the single parent family is the rarity. People, you know, we now have the two income family as the norm in the middle class uh, and in working class families. And, and the point is, it's wonderful that women are working, but the point is that we're having to work 
almost twice as hard to keep pace with where we, where we were before. Now, meanwhile, I mean, you know, the, the story that we're always told, of course, is, well, there's tough times and we have to accept this kind of austerity. But in fact, the interesting thing is that there aren't tough times for all. And in fact, uh, as I was mentioning, the economy has continued to grow. The difference is that the gains have gone to the top. Uh, so that, for instance, um, uh, the top 1%, the top earning 1% in the past 30 years, they have more than doubled their share of the national income. But if we look even higher to the top 0.01%, that very, very top income group in the country, their share of the, of the national income has actually quintupled over the last, uh, last 30 years. So in other words, if you're wondering why is it we don't have that extra leisure time, why is it we, don't, we won't be able to have that retirement age? It's such an acceptance I find out there uh, people are sort of saying, yeah, people are living longer, so I guess it makes sense that we, uh, you know, that the retirement age should be raised. Well, this is just, of course, the argument that the right wing, that the conservatives want us to believe. Uh, in fact, the simple truth is the efficiency gains made by our economy should have entitled us to work much less hard. It's simply because the rules have been changed in such a way that, in fact, the uh, income benefits, the income gains, are all going to those at the top. And that's why people will have to wait till 67 to retire. Now, of course, when I say how can this be justified, of course, we get justifications in the media for this kind of thing. We're told that uh, the reason this happens has something to do with the free market. Okay, the free market. And the way that, you know, and we can't interfere with that. We can't go taxing that. You know, we can't have high taxes on that because that would interfere with the free workings of the marketplace. And don't you love when they talk about the, the marketplace? They always make it sound like some kind of natural organism, you know, that, that it's kind of governed by the laws of nature, the laws of physics, the laws of science, the laws of gravity. Whereas, in fact, the truth is the marketplace is governed by nothing more than the laws that are created by the people in society, man-made, human-made laws. And if you adjust those laws in different ways, uh, you create different results. So, for instance, what's really happened is that by adjusting the laws, by, for instance, weakening labor legislation, by, uh, you know, relying more on privatization and deregulation and all these sorts of things, uh, we change the laws. We change the laws in ways that leave workers disempowered and greatly empower those at the top. We make the laws governing executive stock options, very favorable, that sort of thing. And as a result of those changes, we get those, that big run up in income at the top. So, so my point in that is to note that even before we get to what happens through the tax system, we have a system where the gigantic rewards that go to the top and the minimal rewards that go to the bottom are determined not by some natural workings of the marketplace and certainly not by some uh, sense of justice or anything like that. They're determined by who in society holds the power, the power to put in place the laws that shape the market system. Uh, now, among other things, the truth is in the in the past 30 years, one of the things that they've been very effective at doing, along with weakening labor laws and privatization, deregulation, probably the, one of the key things they've been able to do is to uh, get control of the tax system and gut the progressive, pro pro progressive tax system that we had in the early post-war period, where the people at the upper end paid, uh, paid higher taxes than those 
you know, proportionally higher taxes than those lower down. Uh, and, and among other things, the impact of this, all these tax cuts for the rich that we've seen in the past 30 years, is that they've, it's left our public institutions uh, dramatically underfunded. You know, we simply don't have the revenue to properly support so many of our vital institutions that we used to. Um, and, and we see this, for instance, with, you know, our universities, our hospitals, uh, increasingly turning to private donors, to philanthropists, uh, to make up the, the, the money they need to operate. Uh, and, and, and in fact, you know, this whole thing about in, philanthropy has become a, a huge deal where, uh, in fact, in many of our universities, if you walk around virtually every major building, even every classroom almost, is named after some incredibly rich individual. Uh, now, you know, maybe that seems okay. You know, maybe it seems all right. We've lost the money that they used to pay through the tax system to support these institutions, but we're getting it now through philanthropy. Maybe that seems like a reasonable trade-off. Why not just if they want to give it, you know, make them feel good about giving it through philanthropy, why, why, should, we, why should we argue with that? But, but I, I would actually like to take, take issue with that, um, you know, and, 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 and the reason I want to take issue with it is because I think it makes an absolutely huge difference whether we collect money from the rich through taxation or whether we collect it through philanthropy. And the reason is, is when we collect it through, uh, you know, through taxation, we get to, to decide what to do with it. You know, we collectively, as a country and as a society, make the decision what's going to happen to that money. I mean, that, that's actually democracy. That, that's, that's the essence of democracy in many ways, is the ability to tax and to make collective decisions on how to spend. Whereas, if we collect money through philanthropy instead, then the rich make the decisions. They get to decide. They get to decide, first of all, where the money's going to go, where they're going to choose to direct their resources. And of course, because they get a tax break as a result of their, their donation, they're also directing a lot of public money as well you know, to these important organizations. Uh, so and, and among other things, for instance, when the rich uh, decide where their money's going to go. One of the things that you notice, if you look at the statistics on philanthropy, is that they tend to be very ungenerous when it comes to giving to things that benefit the poor. You know, it seems that they're a lot more interested in having their names in, you know, emblazoned on big buildings, you know, their alma mater, or some uh, concert hall that they like attending. And they're not particularly interested in making donations to, let's say, community centers or recreation halls in the poorer parts of town, where I guess, you know, their friends and colleagues don't tend to drive through those parts of town and see their, their name all lit up in lights. Uh, and the other thing is that when they give their money, let's say, to universities or hospitals, uh, you know, they, they want to have a lot of influence over how that money is spent. And I would argue that this is particularly important with our universities, because our universities, after all, are vital places uh, when it comes to, you know, being places of critical thought, hopefully, and skeptical inquiry, and challenges to the prevailing orthodoxy of our time. That's what universities are supposed to be. That's the whole idea behind academic freedom, is that there will be these, this important institution that will be free to examine the ways that we're doing things and to offer critical analysis and critical uh, interpretation, critical recommendations. Now, can we really expect universities to perform that function when they're increasingly beholden to the richest members of society, whose, of course, interest is largely in enjoying the status quo, not seeing challenges to that status quo. 
Um, you know, we failed to make the case and to argue for and stand up for a, a much more egalitarian society. And at the center of that egalitarian society, I would argue, is the role of taxes. I mean, taxes are the, you know, the, the, the price we pay for a more egalitarian society. I mean, we, we know taxes are the price we pay for civilization. They're the price we pay for citizenship in a democracy and for having the kind of social services, public services that contribute to the common good. And furthermore, the tax system is an incredibly powerful tool for redistributing income. Uh, to, to take some of those bloated incomes at the top that have been unjustly created, uh, you know, by making the, the laws favorable to, you know, to CEOs and making them unfavorable to workers. Uh, so the, the tax is an incredibly powerful tool to take that whole distribution of income and redistribute it to some extent. And it's, it's in fact, because it's such a powerful tool for redistribution, that the right hates taxes so much because it's such a powerful tool in the hands of ordinary people, in the hands of a, of a democracy, in the hands of sort of the collective wishes of the, of the ordinary group of people uh, for redistribution, that what they've sought to do is to demonize, demonize taxes and make us feel that there's some kind of evil and that above all we must do things to reduce them because they're afraid that if they don't do that, if taxes aren't demonized, if we allow a progressive system to be in place, that there's a danger always that the majority will use their majority power to in fact impose higher taxes on the rich that will in fact cause that redistribution that they are so terrified about. So what they've done is vilified taxes and made ordinary people think that they're they're the enemy, uh, and sadly, as I say, I think we've unfortunately allowed this, when I say we, I mean those of us on the progressive side, all of us here tonight, we've allowed that to happen. I mean, there's an absolutely powerful case that can be made for taxes, and I think we have to make that case more, more vigorously and more, with more enthusiasm, and you know, you, you can see this if you look, for instance, at the difference between the low-tax countries, the United States and Canada, versus the high-tax countries of Scandinavia. Uh, you know, the, the simple truth is that all the talk about global competitiveness, uh, the simple truth is that actually the record in recent years on global competitiveness uh, is, is very much in the favor of the Scandinavian countries, the World Economic Forum in Geneva that marks the, you know, evaluates countries in order of competitiveness, actually finds repeatedly year after year, puts the Scandinavian countries in the top 10. Uh, they, they're all in the top 10 of global competitiveness. So this whole argument that you need to be, have low taxes in order to survive in the global economy, just is absolutely disproven by this World Economic Forum rating. And the World Economic Forum is an organization that's in fact uh, a kind of business sponsored organization, so it's not even like a kind of pinko thing. So, so the, the results of, of the Scandinavian countries are simply uh, every bit as impressive, if not more impressive, than the sort of low tax model that we have here in Canada and the United States. But of course, the real story is not just that the Scandinavian countries are competitive, the real story is the wonderful, wonderful things they're able to do with this very much higher level of taxation that they have. Just the fantastic health care, education, pensions, home care, child care, parental leaves, just things that we simply can't even possibly imagine here. Um, Free university tuition, for instance. You know, we're having this big strike in Quebec. In, in, in the Scandinavian countries, it's free university tuition. Uh, 
And, and I guess what strikes me, what the really point I'm trying to make is how appealing this stuff is. You know, we, we wring our hands in despair thinking how can we ever go up, up against Harper? <laughs> you know, this is what is being sold. This is what, you know, what they're selling austerity, doing without, giving up two years of their, of one's retirement. Whereas the Scandinavian models is celebrating more time off, sharing benefits that are just wildly belong anything that we can imagine. I guess my point is we should be clobbering the Harper set there with all their austerity and doing without and you know, learning to live tighter and to make our belts tighter and tighter. But instead, what's happening? Instead, you know, they're kind of clobbering us. What do we have? We have, you know, Stephen Harper. You know, in Toronto, we've got a mayor, you know, Ford. <laughs> you know, how can this be happening given the incredible desirability of what's being offered on the other side? So I guess what I'm arguing is what, what we need in this country, I think, is a powerful campaign to restore our progressive taxation uh, so we can redistribute income more broadly and more fairly the way we did so effectively in that early post-war period, uh, and, and so that we can actually protect and even expand, expand our social programs that benefit everyone in society, those vital public services that are so much being cut back today. Uh, and I would argue at the heart of this campaign should be economic arguments, economic arguments about showing, you know, how in fact strong economic growth can be under these systems of, uh, you know, of higher taxes for the rich, that it's not detrimental to the economy, in fact in many ways the argument is that in fact it contributes to economic growth and that that's why the Scandinavian countries do so well economically because through their tax and transfer system they actually manage to develop each individual to the full extent of their capability, which is really the secret to creating a more effective society, more productive society. But I would also argue in addition to those economic arguments at the center of our campaign should be a moral argument a moral argument that we shouldn't back down from that would be all about what kind of society we want to live in and the kind of values, the kind of common good, the kind of sharing of resources and uh, vision of uh, a public good, that that be the centerpiece of society. And that it, and by the way, when they start telling us that we can't do it, the deficits are too high, et cetera, et cetera, you know, it's worth noting that back in 1936, at the very height of the Depression, uh, when things were much, much grimmer proportionally even than they are today, it was back in 1936 that in the United States, FDR brought in Social Security. And of course, everybody at the time the, he said it was absolutely impossible, but he had the public behind him, and he was absolutely tenacious and he managed to put in place and get the full support of Congress, Social Security that has survived to this day and that of course is now under attack by the Tea Party. So, so let, me, let me just say in conclusion, and I want to kind of leave on a, on a positive note, I, I want to point out, uh, despite some of the depressing things I've been saying, that in fact the good news is, here's the good news, the good news is Canadians care about equality. I don't know if you saw that poll in the National Post the other day, fascinating poll, National Post of all places, uh, showing that 75% of Canadians think the income gap between the rich and the poor is too big. Uh, and that's right across the country. In, in Alberta, 63% think that. So clearly there's a constituency for reducing that gap. Polls also show that Canadians care about preserving strong social programs. And now, now sure, if you ask them, you know, do you want a tax cut? Uh, you know, they'll say yes. You know, do you want a tax cut? Do you want some 
chocolate? Do you want some ice cream? Do you want some pizza? Yeah, they'll say yes. But if you ask more intelligent questions, as more serious pollsters do, if you ask them, do you want a tax cut, or do you want that money to be invested instead in developing our healthcare system, developing our education systems, developing stronger pensions, et cetera, by overwhelming margins, overwhelming margins, Canadians say they want stronger social reinvestment, not the tax cut. Now, I realize this flies in the face of what you hear in the media all the time, right? In fact, if you listen to the media, you'd get the impression everybody's crazed about cutting taxes. Everybody out there is suffering from tax rage. You know, they're so angry. Well, I, I just want to point out that, in fact, the truth is almost nobody is suffering from tax rage. And I would argue it's time that we fought back. It's time that we demanded that this be a more equal society. It's time that we demanded that this be a society where everyone enters by the front door. Thank you very much.